Good evening, folks. This is The Weird Part, and I am your host, Vincent Trewell. My very special guest tonight is a true scholar of the paranormal, a prolific author, and a full-time musician. Welcome, not for the first time, but so far for the best time, Joshua Cutchin. Welcome aboard, Josh. Hi, it's so good to be here. Um, you know, it's... Well, I feel like I always say something similar with different podcasters, but I mean it this time. Um, it's, <laughs> it's, it's it's always nice to, you know, um, have a show where you consider someone, you know, a, a friend as opposed to just going in cold and trying to get a read on somebody. And, you know, having a little bit of a rapport is nice. And this is no exception. So I, I'm really happy to be here. I could not think of a better way to spend tonight. Oh, my pleasure. Um Josh is a sought-after podcast guest, to say the minimum. For those that are kind of in this sphere of interest, um, this is, you know, a person that uh, is highly valued, and for good reason, as you'll soon find out if you're not a veteran listener. Um, but yes, um, well, I guess the the most recent thing that comes to mind, even though it did take place last year, but it's a epic journey is you completed a book or more properly a two volume set um, plus a bibliography called ecology of souls a new mythology of death and the paranormal and i'm sure you've been interviewed repeatedly about this work i've listened to half of them <laughs> <laughs> but to kind of get us started do you consider this a continuation of your previous books beginning a few years ago a number of years ago with brimstone deceit which, for those unaware, this is, I believe, the only book written about paranormal odors and smells and scents and fascinating material. Um, and continuing through a number of other books, including Where the Footprints End with Timothy Renner, do you see ecology as a continuation of that or as a move in a different direction philosophically, a change in your worldview? That's a good question, and 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 I and I like it because um, because I haven't heard it before. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, for a while, so my, my first book was was a Trojan feast, and it was talking about food and drink exchanges, and then I did Brimstone, which was all about smells. Oh. And everybody thought that I was going to do like the five senses of of the paranormal, you know. Um, but I didn't. I wanted. I did, whenever people think I'm going to zag, I, I like to zig, you know. Um. So, you know, there, there was... There the touching some... book just would have been so... Weird. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It would have been... That's, that's, that, that's my go-to joke, right? Is that like the, the touching, you know, the touching, a Trojan touch. That's got a whole new home meaning, right? Um, but, you know, there have been... I mean, obviously, you're not going to do a book about sight because basically all the books are about sight. And, um, you know, there are some good... There's some good scholarship out there already on, like, you know, paranormal music and, and sounds. I think still think that might be a topic I might revisit at some point. But anyway, so I did those two books and then I did uh, Thieves in the Night, which was, you know, a departure. It was on supernatural child abductions. And then after that um, was the Footprint series. So trying to nest ecology of souls within that framework, um, I don't think it's it's really a continuation in any, in any way of the first three. I think that you know, to give all proper uh, kudos to Timothy Renner, I think that a lot of ecology um, is a natural outgrowth of of where the footprints end. Um, in fact, in in the in volume two of Ecology of Souls, because I I tried to go through everything, so I ended up getting to cryptids too. I just have to flat out say, you know, look, we're going to cover Bigfoot a little bit, but a, a more thorough job on Bigfoot and death can't be done than than was done to a certain degree and in, in you know where the footprints in because there's an entire chapter you know dedicated to the overlap between bigfoot and and ghost phenomena so mm -hmm. um so i think in that sense it's a continuation of some of those um footprints ideas but in a lot of ways even though it's not a continuation of of that earlier stuff um this is one of the first books that i that i thought of um I've been sitting on this for probably somewhere between five and, and six, maybe even seven years. I actually, wow. uh, I actually, when I was, when I was looking at, at, uh, at putting together ecology of souls, I found an old PowerPoint that I did for one of our, uh, 
our annual paramania gatherings that me and my friends get together and do and the powerpoint was from 2018 um and it was titled one big ghost story which was that was sort of like my playing with the idea of this all being sort of one big uh afterlife narrative one big sort of death narrative and that's really the you know the meat of where the paranormal lies is is in that connection to um whatever happens when we die so it's it's been an idea that i've been kicking around for a while which you know, in hindsight, might have something to do with the with how quickly it came together. Um, started writing in March of 2021, and I finished in January or early February of 2022. Um, and you know, it's 260 thousand words, so I, I kind of look back on it now, and I'm like, how the heck did I do that? <laughs> you know, <laughs> did I do that? You know, because what I found, we were talking earlier about, you know, the, the fiction stuff and um, it's, it's, it's obviously more difficult in some ways and, and hard and uh, easier in some ways. But um, I will say that like the, the speed at which at least I am able to do fiction seems to be a lot faster because I'm not doing all those endless citations and references and end notes and making sure I'm pecking out the exact right quote um, to be included. So the fact that it came together as quickly as it did, um, I think does speak to the fact that I've been thinking about it for a while. So that's sort of a roundabout answer to your question, I suppose. But No, I think that does hit, hit on it. Um, in one minor thing, the reason I've always written fiction is because I hate doing research and you know i could just okay we'll make up some new facts fit the story better this is fiction anyway but um, well and, and, and let's face it like very different worlds let's face it aspects of it are more fun right i mean you know, oh yes i'm not gonna lie that there is a thrill uh to finding the exact quote that you want um there's some there's some bits of research that popped up in ecology of souls where it was like you know i can't believe i actually found this um and it was really exciting but it's also more fun to just sort of tailor the content to your own uh desires and whatnot so. <laughs> the story you want to tell and we'll just tell it you know? yeah yeah <laughs> right now for what it's worth i'm actually working on a non-fiction book my, which will be my first and so i'm getting a taste of that research and there is yeah it is a thrill when you find oh great this is something that precisely fits to what i need it you're digging and you find the thing you're digging for. That is, that is pretty sweet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Especially when it's like, I'm not necessarily even controversial, but what if it's something that like, hasn't been really addressed or somebody's never really unpacked the implications of, it's just, it's one of, you know, what, what, since we're on the, since we're on the subject, um, there was a, uh, a great bit of scholarship from this gentleman by the name of, I believe, Richard Warner, um, who was a former curator of a museum in Ulster, Ireland. And uh, I guess that's Northern Ireland. Anyway, um, and he I'm actually... I'm not going to get political, but yeah. it's Ireland. <laughs> yeah, okay, 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 good. <laughs> my, 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 my sense of Irish geography is better than most people, but not as good as people in Ireland. And, you know, I always feel real <laughs> sheepish when I get corrected on it. No, um, no, no. It's... But uh, but he um, he, had a, he, had, he had a paper that he put forth, um, which was just like exactly one of those things we're talking about. This is like sort of mind blowing revelation. And it was on the uh, the structure of these hingeform uh, ring forts that you find in, you know, Ireland and, you know, more loosely across the, the British Isles as well. Um, and uh, it was it was written from it was written from the standpoint of someone who you could tell put some credence into these alternative not necessarily alternative histories, but alternative ways of thinking about history. And it was his his basic argument was that, you know, over the years we've said, why does it look like these hingeform forts have moats on the outside? That doesn't look like they're especially defensible. And his his main contention was, no, it was to keep things in, not to not to keep people out. You know, yeah. Um, so it's a, a lovely little bit of scholarship, and just the fact that that existed at all was just, you know, I, it was one it was one of those things where I just wanted to like copy paste the entire the entire paper into, <laughs> into my book but I, I i resisted but um it was just you know and, and sometimes you find a little piece of of research like that that just blows apart you know everything that you're looking for and just leads you down into an entirely new uh area of speculation so yeah it's it's it carries its own thrill let's put it that way yes yes indeed um let's see with this particular work can you tell the listeners 
how you got started on it? Like what inspired you? There were a couple of things. Um, so the most superficial thing that got me thinking in this direction was a quote. And I know we've spoke a little bit uh, off the air about this personality, but there's a quote from uh, Whitley Strieber's late wife, Ann Strieber. And in the wake of communion, uh, probably the most famous alien abduction book ever written, Whitley received a ton of correspondence. Um, a lot of that's currently housed at Fondren Library at Rice University. But he received a lot of correspondence from other experiencers. And you know, I've never really completely clarified this, but you get the sense from uh, from reading Whitley's work that Anne was sort of functioning in sort of a, I guess, secretarial capacity, but that sounds it's kind of a dirty word, I guess, in this sense. Research you know, assistant, a, maybe? Yeah, research assistant is probably a little bit better. Anyway, um, so she was she was basically the one doing all the reading. And at one point, he he's mentioned this in a couple of his books. He he goes into you know the room where she's keeping all these letters, and she has some observations scrawled across this you know piece of um, yellow you know le yellow legal pad, and it says this has something to do with what we call death. And that's such a foreign idea to insert into the alien abduction mythos, um, especially if you just consume it through popular culture. Uh, it's 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 an idea that you know, we, we kind of have an affinity for, um, anybody who's seen Fargo season two will probably see some connections, uh, with that. That's my favorite piece of, of UFO media, <laughs> by the way, um, is Fargo season two, but like, so, so there's a death thread, a death thread, not death threat, but a death thread that runs through a lot of the UFO stuff, but it's not some, an idea that we really seriously entertain. So that was always in the back of my head. Like, what, what do you do with that? Like, can we unpack that statement, please? Because so much of what I try to do is is taking these little tiny observations that people make and try to say, well, what does this say about the phenomenon? I mean, you know, brimstone deceit is a great example of that. People having one sentence dedicated to the smell of a UFO, and I'm like, yeah, but what is like? Have you looked into what that means? So, mm -hmm. so there was yeah. this is it, there was this this thing. This has something to do with what we call death quote that always got that was always stuck with me. Um, the other the other two things, which I didn't really fully appreciate until a little bit later on my journey and all this was um there's something that jacques valet left on the table in passport to magonia so anybody who's familiar with my work knows that i treat uh jacques valet's 1969 work passport to magonia as like a foundational text in the way that i look at the phenomenon um and it illustrates that a lot of what we see in the modern ufo literature is a very close reflection of some of these little people myths that you see the world over, you know, Western Europe, 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 especially, but you can kind of, you know, blow that out and look at all, all different cultures and, you know, wherever there are cultures, there are little people, <laughs> myths and legends. Yes. So he said, you know, okay. So, so basically the idea was, Hey, this UFO stuff looks like this fairy stuff. And of course, you know, the, the official stance is not that UFOs or not that aliens are fairies or fairies are aliens, but that these are just cultural culture dependent terms to describe this other thing but i got to thinking at one point and i and i had to ask you know okay this was passport to magonia in 1969 what would a you know 13th century version of passport to magonia look like and and it would i i would argue um that's a lot of what book one of the ecology of souls is i would argue that it would say, hey, these fairies look a lot like these ghosts. And, you know, the fairy dead connection has always been super strong. I mean, there's an argument to be made that prior to the rise of theosophy in the late um, 19th century, that the connection to the dead was the primary way that most cultures who thought about fairies actually did think about fairies as having something to do, again, like wow. Anne Streber would say centuries later, <laughs> something has something to do, to do yeah, with what we call dead. <laughs> You know, either that the fairies were the dead or that they were some of our stewards of the dead. But, you know, every, if you go back and look through some of these seminal fairy texts, you know, the Lady Gregory stuff and the Lady Wild stuff and the Evans Went stuff and even some of the Yates stuff, even though Yates was a little bit fiction prone, um, you'll find constant references to people going to a fairy palace and the way that they know not to drink the drink the drink the drink or eat the food is because they're warned by someone who just died who just died in the community you know so there's this, uh -huh. this sort of intermixing there so that was point number 2 and then point number 3 um is 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 a little bit more um 
actually in some ways it was one of the leaping off points for this book um is the connection between uh, a lot of these what we call aliens today and psychopomps which are these folk figures or religious figures that guide you from our life into the afterlife characters like hermes and anubis and uh, the grim reaper even you know um or even you know in, in the abrahamic traditions you know the angels and, and christianity jesus to a certain degree anything that is a psychopomp um is something that that takes you across that transition in some cultures these this was natural phenomena like you know the sun and moon and uh aurora borealis or you know especially in um indigenous cultures these were often animals like as luck would have it you know birds dogs and and horses and uh, all three of those animals have their own special affinity with the ufo phenomenon so if you look at sort of the work of someone like george p hansen the trickster in the paranormal he goes to great lengths to sort of bring in Hermes as trickster and show how all that sort of trickster aspect is seen throughout the paranormal. But there's, again, just like with Valet, there's something that's sort of left on the table there, which is, well, Hermes was also a, a psychopomp. He was a trickster and a psychopomp. And uh, so you can start drawing connections uh, to all these things in some, in some really strange and surprising ways. And uh, I will say the reception uh, that I've gotten to ecology so far has been really um, encouraging. It's such a weird idea for most people. Um, it's a sensitive idea for most people. You know, people have very private ideas about what happens after we die. And when you start saying that UFOs are somehow mixed up in it, there's an understandable, I think, reaction to that. Oh, but, yes. I um, got to tell yeah. you, when I first started hearing about kind of the outlines of what you're going to be writing about, I'm like, so, like, the greys handle us after, you know, we die? I'm not totally comfortable with them showing up, you know? Yeah, I mean, I mean I'm not saying maybe. what you're saying, but it's... <laughs> no, I mean, but, but it's but, interesting. So, I mean, that's, that's really what it comes down to is... um is not like I, I kind of at, at towards the end of book two I kind of say well this might be a model for the way that the UFO phenomenon is interfacing with us through death but like you have there's so many different there's so many different ideas that so many different tangents that you sprout off on you know oh yes um and you know I, I think I kind of personally have landed on that sort of and streberism which is something to do with what we call death I don't know what death is i don't know exactly what they do but there does seem to be a, there does seem to be a link there um and you know so it was going to be a really tidy project it was going to be a ufo book right it was going to be a, a ufo book i can get in and out of this with ufos i'm like well okay i've got to talk about the fairy stuff and then i just kept going and going and and you see the tendrils of this death thread um running through all paranormal things in ways that i never really thought would be applicable i mean the fact that you can even make some of those connections with you know lake monsters or i mean mothman's pretty obvious right because mothman heralded is a disaster but you end up talking about near-death experiences and ley lines of all things i never knew that i'd be end up talking about ley lines when you're talking about death but if you look at the some of these traditions of the way that spirits would travel and some of these corpse roads and some of the straight lines that these spirits of the dead were said to travel along, then yeah, you're talking about ley lines. So you're talking about all this, just, it just, it ended up being, as the subtitle says, a new mythology of, of death in the paranormal. And, you know, I wrestled with that mythology thing because it sounds so presumptuous, like, you know, a new mythology, but it does, I think, end up being holistic in a really interesting way that quite frankly scares me. Um, because uh, I've, I've always been taught by my mentor, Greg Bishop, to not get too high on your own supply when it comes to this <laughs> stuff. You know, the, 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 moment, the moment you think you've figured it out is the moment before you fall, right? Um, so I, I, what I nowadays is I try to sit with the whole ecology of souls model in my head as a way for me to make peace with some of the outliers that I didn't really know how to pay, make peace with. Um, for example, in the book, I I found a way to rationalize uh, Dogman. I found a way to rationalize um, these sightings where UFOs turn into <laughs> birds, uh -huh. which is something like, you know, it's, it, you hear like, a, I saw a UFO and it turned into a bird. And you're like, okay, this person's a real loony. But like, I know some people, <laughs> I know some people who are I, friends who I had that experience. know yeah. a woman who had a contemporaneous UFO sighting with her mother. 
And she saw a fixed craft, a mm-hmm. flying saucer, you know, straight from the 50s movies. Mm-hmm. Her mother saw a very weird bird. Yeah. And so, they're looking yeah, at the that, same yeah, yeah. thing at the same yeah. time. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, like, so, so you, have, you can do a couple of things with that. Like, you can say, okay, well, this person's crazy. And I know you're talking about, and I love her to death, and she's not. <laughs> um, so you can say that this person's crazy, or you can say that they were mistaken, or you can say screen memories, or you can do any number of things, but you, you've got to do something with it, right? Yes. Um, and and with the Ecology of Souls model, I was able to figure out a way to sort of tie that into the idea of the UFO as soul and the bird as a universal soul symbol. It just, I guess what I'm trying to get at, because I feel like I'm rambling way no, too much no. right now, but what I'm trying to get at is that... Um, I find a degree of utility and parsimony in the ecology of souls idea that helps me make peace with some of this stuff. Not like it was keeping me up at night, but like it, it allows, no, I, it, it allows it me to say, just... maybe, you know, maybe it's this, maybe we can all sort of, you know, shovel it into, into this. And so I try to keep that in one side of my brain and in the other side of my brain, be open to all sorts of, of other alternative hypotheses is, is basically mm-hmm. where I ended up landing and if if you can do that if you can resist the urge to say no it must be this and you know which is a common i think everybody suffers that to some extent the desire to for certainty which yeah, we're this, not going to get certainty with any the, of the stuff we the, shall not yeah, get certainty. No. The, the certainty fetish is, is what greg calls it and uh yeah. and, and i think that's i think that's really accurate and i understand it but once you sort of divorce yourself especially also divorcing yourself from like one model or another being like personally attached to you um Mm -hmm. uh then it it sort of makes life a lot easier (laughs) well yes and you brought up the term holistic and that's something that i've always really liked about your work that it's you've really broken away and you're not alone in this but you're a, a figure in this getting away from the idea and really a lot of the people that we know in common are in this kind of new school if you want to call it that um i don't like calling it that but you know in this way of seeing the paranormal as holistic as n- we're not looking for bigfoot scat okay and we're not looking for <laughs> right. for ufo landing sites where they burn the the ground we're, yeah. we're more looking at it as a big picture as the other as the phenomena and i think that's a lot more fruitful intellectually yeah, my go-to argument is always that um, you take just the flying saucer question, um, which, you know, there's a strong case that I adhere to that they're older than the Kenneth Arnold sighting. But let's just say that the saucer age started with Kenneth Arnold sighting. Um, 70 years of looking at this by itself and looking at it solely or primarily, I guess I should say, through the lens of extraterrestrial visitation has not really gotten us a heck of a lot closer to answers. So if nothing else, like, let's just try something different, you know, and let's let's address the fact that um, there are Bigfoot sightings that sound a lot like UFO sightings and UFO sightings that sound a lot like near-death experiences and shamanic initiation. And, you know, it, well, I personally see too many similarities to to think that these are entirely separate. They still might be, but at the same time, I think that there is there's some real usefulness in in looking at these things again, like we said, more holistically. Um, because it, I just something I don't know how I landed on this sort of this. I don't know how I got the comparativists be in my bonnet, but I did, and um, mm-hmm. that's 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 the primary thing that I'm interested in right now. It's not you know an endless string of dates of alleged flying saucer crashes. It's how does you know this citing from you know uh casey iowa in 1945 look like an ancient sumerian text you know that's that's where i find it really that's oh where yes. i find that makes resonance it, i guess yes so unless these this week we're going to have congressional hearings on the uaps so unless that straightens out everything um which <laughs> that's that's a whole that's a whole nother old man rant that you can have me go on if you, yes, if you want yes. to but maybe we should avoid that <laughs> Barring that, uh, I think that we'll have quite a future of drawing connections from all over the world, from all through time. We've been inter we as humans have been interacting with something else, whether that be 
all of they're all one thing or putting on many masks mm -hmm. or whether they're a whole herd of different things there's something there that's not us but is at least as intelligent as us and that's giving us a lot of credit <laughs> and yeah. you know that yeah. we've been talking to something since we could talk and that i find fascinating yeah i i, I really do resonate with that and you know to sort of pick up a pick up and then quickly put back down <laughs> a thread that you mentioned you know i i do think that there's we need more of a healthy attitude and like, okay, it's all this or it's all that, or it's, it's nothing, you know, the sort of, you know, my go-to response is that like 80% of UFO sightings, especially when they're just lights in the sky um, or even structured craft are probably misidentifications. Uh, and that remaining 20% is probably a smorgasbord of, you know, uh, some sort of psi phenomena, um, uh, you know, non-conventional aircraft, um, uh, misunderstood or unrecognized atmospheric phenomena and then maybe spirit phenomena and maybe you know maybe hey aliens right like yes, yes. <laughs> you know as, as much grief as like the ancient aliens crew gets um it only has to have happened once in human history for the hypothesis to hold some water right like we only have oh, yes. been visited once by aliens so i i kind of i kind of sympathize in that regard but but yeah um i i, I think that that is one of the most compelling things is that it it whatever this is and again returning to speaking holistically about the, the phenomenon i like the fact that you use that word um it has been a fellow traveler with us and i think that gets overlooked when you have you know the people at skeptic magazine saying oh ufo started in the 40s and oh bigfoot started in the 50s it's like no this is not that's not <laughs> an accurate reading and um if you sort of broaden these categories beyond the labels that we have put on them since then, these things do seem to go back literally to the dawn of our existence. I mean, you know, take a look at those cave paintings of therianthropic yes. people with, you know, antlers growing out of their heads and yes. you know, bird heads or, you know, <laughs> at poles. I mean, it's, it, it does seem to be something. These, these are motifs that are ancient and they continue to show up to this very day. And they're so universal. Yes. There's not one, I, I'm going to, and I could, I'll be free if anybody wants to correct me, but I don't think that I'm wrong about this. There has never been a culture walking this earth that we have any record of that didn't believe in other intelligences beyond human. Well, except and for the modern, and, except for the modern culture, right? <laughs> yes, we created one in the last since 1950, I guess. <laughs> but, um, yeah. you know. No, um, I, mean, I, I, I think you're absolutely right in that regard. Um, which is really strange if there's nothing there, you know? Yeah, and you know, it, and 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 so even if you take more conservative stances towards that idea, um, it still leads you into really fa fascinating territory. I mean, like I've talked about this before, but people tend to get a little bit prickly when I suggest that these are all archetypes from the collective unconscious. They're like, oh, well, you know, I really wanted to be little green scientists or oh i wanted it to be a big <laughs> monkey in the forest i'm like no do, do you understand what i'm saying when i say that the collective unconscious is is a real well of of archetypes and imagery that we all draw upon that we're all born with um these ideas that transmit without cultural contamination from you know from vastly separated culture to vastly separated culture i mean that's a miraculous idea um and I think that at the very least, something like that has to be going on. Um, and, you know, the flip side of that is, you know, when you're talking about the, the universality of these motifs, some people will sort of fall back on that position that there was a global culture, which I'm sympathetic to that idea because I'm sympathetic to anything that, <laughs> that upends <laughs> conventional <laughs> wisdom, right? Yes, but at, yes. the, but at the same time, like, I think that 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 um, does a disservice to the fact that whatever this is seems to be a birthright of being a human being connection and you know dare i say communion with mm -hmm. this other realm seems to be something that it's 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 the software that comes out of the box you know <laughs> you unpack the human being and it's already uploaded onto the mainframe yes and it's fascinating to me that even if there was and i strongly personally feel that there was a 
lost prehistoric civilization. That wouldn't explain why a medieval European comes upon a saint and, you know, or a leprechaun and a pre-Columbian Mayan comes upon a very different being and an Australian indigenous Aboriginal person comes upon something completely different, but everybody comes upon something from time to time. Yes. Yeah. And, and it's just worldwide. Yeah. And, and and the message is, you know, we aren't alone. And even if it's, even if it's an aspect of ourselves, which is an idea that our mutual friend Soraya Ascap turned me on to, I, I remember Soraya suggested that and I, I got, I was the one who got prickly, you know, I was like, no, I, <laughs> I want it to be something stranger. But like, I, especially with the ecology of souls, if you're talking about the soul, you're talking about the idea that as a lot of cultures once believed that we could actually project our souls outside of our bodies, or at least make them visible in some form or fashion to the observer, to the owner of the soul, you have to start entertaining that idea, you know, that this, that this thing that we think is another intelligence um, actually is a, a human intelligence and whether or not it's the, something from the collective unconscious of humanity, or it's, a, it's part of the observer's self that's reflecting back. Um, again, you just have to sit back and say, well, that's miraculous too, and, and move on. But so, so oh, that's yeah. why if we're That's doing it, it's yeah. still something important and right. you know fascinating, you know. Yeah, yeah, and so so that's why, like you know, when people ask me what I really think about this stuff, I, mm. I always hesitate to say that there's something besides us because it's always like, well, there's something besides us unless it is us, but it's a really weird version of us that we don't quite understand. <laughs> and, you know, yeah. just to just to go back briefly, you mentioned the collective unconsciousness, and I know. Carl Jung and the idea that there is a sort of, well, correct me if I'm describing this wrong, but that there is a sort of human humanities, like you might say, super subconscious that we all have some kind of access to just by being humans that live on earth. Is that Sound about right? Is that a yeah? I think, I think it's a pretty good way. Yeah, I think it's a pretty good way, good way of putting it. What I, what I'm fond of saying nowadays is that um that the archetypes, which are sort of arise out of that collective unconscious, are sort of like the source code of reality. Um, oh. So that's the way that I like to put it. So you know, if you imagine Matrix having the veil taken off his eyes and seeing <laughs> the ones and zeros, that's kind of that's kind of what the archetypes are. Because you look at these these characters um, in their most basic diluted forms. Um, and they do spring up across cultures that should, that historically speaking, there is no record of of them interacting. You know? um, that, that's for example. Um, I think this is this is one that I mean, obviously fascinated me because it was the inspiration for the first book, of Trojan Feast. But um, you know, the Persephone myth, the idea that she goes to the underworld and she is about to be release but she eats some pomegranate seeds that are cursed and she has to stay in 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 the underworld forever um that's fine it's it's fine to say that variations of that when seen throughout the eurasian slash african landmass are part of like a cultural diaspora or like a, a a legend diaspora that's fine to say because like we have a record of these cultures we, you can you can find you can you can trace a, a line right you can trace a line sure, from trade routes and yeah trade routes. empires you can trace, and yeah, you, you can trace a line from south africa all the way to yakutsk if you want to right like that's that's fine but when you see that same idea of consuming food in the other world and being trapped there forever pop up in you know, new zealand in australia <laughs> and amongst indigenous tribes in north and south america you say okay well something is going on here right and, and I, I and i've thought about this ad nauseum and i keep coming back to three things and any one of them is mind-blowing um and really does upend what we think we know about our world the first one is that the collective unconscious is real which is what we're getting at because it's this idea that we all draw upon you know this very specific idea um that we all draw upon is just built into us as human beings um, option number two is is another idea that we've been talking about, this sort of possible worldwide civilization that had a transmission mm -hmm. of these ideas and, and stories. That's that's also mind-blowing. Or, you know, people were describing this sort of 
set of rules because they were actually this is the way that these things act and behave and they were objectively interacting with something beyond the human you know um and i can't think of any other i mean it, it, please if you can think of a, of a four no i've got nothing others, else that that, that yeah. pretty much covers all the bases it's gotta be you know <laughs> barring I mean, unknown unknowns that's kind of what it has to be one of those yeah, and, and, and the collective unconscious is always fascinating to me for the same reason that, you know, if, if you take a baby chicken and you raise it indoors all its life and you like pass a shadow of a hawk over its head, it's still going to duck and cover and run as if it had been in the barnyard all, you know, for its entire existence. And like we, we say things like, oh, it's instinct that, you know, the the trapdoor spider knows how to make its burrow and when to pop out and sense the vibration though it's instinct we act like that answer is a damn thing <laughs> and it's, it really which is quite a work of you know go ahead and try to build something like out of you know yeah. crochet yeah. that you can live in and then pop out of you know that take a lot well yeah i mean just looking at the human experience and, and how much because i think about this with my twin 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 four-year-olds that i have right now how much software we have to upload into ourselves and you look at something like that you know with an animal that has like a hundred thousandth or millionth of our supposed intelligence and you're like okay what's actually going on here mm -hmm. and that's when i think ideas like collect the collective unconscious really do sort of they're they become a lot more palatable to the lay person i think mm -hmm. just as a simple thing as when your dog lays down to go to bed and he walks in a circle to yep. pat down the grass. Yep. Even though he's on carpet and there hasn't been, he's never been around grass in his life to sleep on. He knows to do that somehow, you know. Yeah, it's 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 a miraculous thing, and that so that's why I'm not sure how familiar you you are with the idea of um of Rupert. Uh, are you familiar with the work of Rupert Sheldrake? Only tangentially. I I haven't. He's on my read pile too. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yes. yeah. He, he's done so. He's done some really cool research. Um, people have tried to sort of poke holes in some of his his experiments, and I don't think that any of them really hold up um, the criticisms. But he he one of the most famous examples that he brought to light was um, was tits. And I just like to say that so I can. Who does that, that actually, hang <laughs> No, I just I like to say that so I can explain myself. Um, <laughs> If memory serves, I can't remember the exact anecdote, but if memory serves um, a group of tits, the birds, in England. Just um, so we're, we're, everybody's on the same page, we're talking about little birds in England that are kind of about the size of a sparrow. Yeah. <laughs> yes and they were they were they were they were they were getting into milk bottles so like they introduced in one part of england a a new type of milk bottle um that was tit proof right <laughs> and um and when they introduced it now and, you're just and, pulling and, my chain and, and, and eventually <laughs> eventually and eventually the, the the you know the tits in that part of england uh were able to get into the milk bottles and then when they introduced them to a completely new part of England, like they got in right away. And you see this in, in some other, you know, psi experiments uh, here and there, where if you have two, um, if you have two identical mazes, uh, you know, on the East coast and the West coast that you're sending a rat through um, the, the, the second rat, second set of rats, what do you want to call it? will always have an easier time getting through the maze than the first rat. And it's this idea that... Hmm. that so, Sheldrake, really yeah, so, so Sheldrake sort of coined the term morphic resonance to describe this sort of... Um, basically, it's kind of like an Akashic record, right? That yes. that that uh, learned knowledge is sort of uploaded into the cloud. And then, you know, it, 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 it becomes this sort of... It becomes more accessible to other individuals of a species... Uh, separated by vast distances and i think that in some ways that makes a lot more sense to me than <laughs> just saying oh it's instinct or they bred you know they oh yeah that so way. it makes a lot yeah. more sense um been carrying around inside their biological brain a whole blueprint for how to build something complex that's harder to believe was he involved with um the 200th monkey study that sounds really similar. He might he might have been. I can't remember off the top of my head. The most famous thing that he's done um, were, uh, were were it was was pet telepathy. Um, okay, 
So his some of his research with dogs um, predicting when their owners come home was really fascinating. Uh, he had dogs that he, he basically demonstrated that as soon as owners came home, there was a tendency for dogs to wait at the door. And this was even the case when the dogs were separated, you know, by, you know, tens of miles from their owners. Like, you know, the, the owner would be 25 miles away and, you know, be monitoring when they got in the car. And sure enough, they get behind the wheel and the dog goes to the front door and starts to wait. So and they mixed really, up the yeah. times. So oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It wasn't just he comes home at four o'clock. It was, yeah, it was, it was controlled they have no for time. Idea. Yeah, it was controlled for time. It was controlled for, you know, variables of the dog's senses because dogs, I think I read one time, his numbers are probably wonky, but I think I mentioned in Brimstone to see that if we could see as well as a dog could smell, we could see something like 10, like a thousand miles away or something silly like oh, that. Wow. So, so um it's not a not a perfect you know analogy but like they were they did all the controls that they could to account for um for all these you know extra these uh heightened senses of dogs and they did they did they did he did find that there was a tendency regardless of where they were even when the times were randomized for the dog to, to go approach the door so it's he, he's he's got some really great work out there um that is fascinating yes sorry I, i've taken us so far afield no, 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 <laughs> that's, that's fine so that's sorry. that's Having you on, that's what I expect to have happen, and <laughs> I'm not disappointed. Um, to, to shift gears a little bit, um, tell our listeners a little bit, a little bit, that would be easy. Um, no, uh, a little bit about co-creation and the difference between the imaginal and the imaginary. I have become a big fan of the idea of co-creation ever since I first heard it proposed by my, my mentor, Greg Bishop. Um, as it turns out, it's it's sort of an older idea. You can probably find some ancient antecedents for it. Uh, Jenny Randall's played with the idea at one point. Hillary Evans, um, who is another researcher that I don't think gets enough love, he, he's played with the idea as well prior to his, um, prior to Greg mentioning it. But it's, it's basically the idea that there is something genuinely anomalous out there that has some sort of intelligence, right? And as we've discussed earlier, it might be non-human, it might be a part of us, whatever, but an intelligence, right? Yes, yes. Um, and the way that we perceive it is dictated by a host of factors. In other words, we're not necessarily seeing exactly what it is. We're seeing something that is perhaps meeting us halfway. Um, it might be determined by our own personal biases um you know the example that i always love to give is um you know when some when you're expecting someone to put to pop chocolate in your mouth you know you have a, a loved one who's like hey here's some chocolate you know here's something to open your mouth close your eyes and you're expecting like chocolate and it's like ground beef and for a moment you're just completely <laughs> disgusted even though you love both you know you're for a moment you're just disgusted because your your expectations are shaping that so the appearance um or even you know other factors auditory olfactory perhaps um, are, are dictated by expectations. They might be dictated by biases. They might be dictated by cultural factors, which I think is probably what we're seeing with the the switch from fairies to UFOs. Um, and they also, uh, you know, might and if be... I could just butt in really yeah. quick, why you see Marian apparitions in Catholic countries, and they don't show up in overwhelmingly Buddhist countries? They might yes. have Buddhist apparitions, but they're not going to have something completely different exactly exactly um and, and 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 you know so there's so that's one aspect of it is that we're we literally we're bringing biases to the table um another aspect is that we just can't comprehend what we're actually seeing kind of like a a positive version of lovecraft is, is what i like to see because you know you read lovecraft and it's like oh I, I can't imagine what it is my brain can't wrap around it but this is like you know oh, i can't imagine what it is but like maybe my brain is protecting me from from seeing its true form Yes, um, and if yeah. I just to interject, that reminds me of a great quote from, and I hope I don't mangle. I'm paraphrasing a little, but only a little, from Terence McKenna, where he says we are dealing with something that is impersonating an alien invasion, so as not to so disturb not to us too much, us. Yeah. <laughs> yes. so as not to alarm us. <laughs> yes. um, yeah, yeah. I mean, and and well, you know, it's also I think it's either Leary or McKenna. I can't remember who said it first, but you know, reality is stranger than not not not. It's not uh, stranger than we than we imagine. It's stranger than we can imagine. You know, um. 
you so did the I, voice I, without me asking. No, no, I had to. I've, it's been a while since so I've done the voice, and I've been through wave after wave of wave of preschool crud, so it's a little dodgy. But, um, so yeah, I, I'm really sympathetic to this idea because it answers a lot of questions of, you know, why do we have so many different types of entities and craft? Why do these things seem to shape shift before our very eyes? It, it, it seems it, 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 um, it's a possibility that can that can fix a lot of outliers and i know we're not supposed to explain one unknown with another unknown i get that but i'm just saying as, as a thought experiment i think it's really handy in that regard so um i suspect that's something that's going on especially when you look at the way that a lot of these different phenomena seem to be as you said earlier like masks you know you see mm -hmm. these bigfoot cases that sound like ufo cases and you get these ufo cases that sound like fairy cases and you know just it seems like we're dealing with something that just sort of changes its appearance and you can either go the you know the indigenous route that these things are shapeshifters or you can go the modern ufologists route that these things project memories or screen memories into our heads but neither of those for various reasons have really you know settled well with me i think the idea of co-creation kind of it's this interesting middle ground that sort of brings biology to play with mysticism in a way that i find really appealing because um the person carrying that co-creative torch now, as I alluded to, is Greg Bishop, and he's been working on a book uh, that ties in some ideas of, you know, information theory. Uh, the example that he always likes to give is that an icon on your desktop uh, of a file is not the actual file itself. It's it's a representation of, of the file. Um, so he thinks that something like that, you know, might be um, might be going on. Not to say that there aren't consequences, you know, if, if if you don't recognize something as a train, it's still going to hit you, you know, yes, <laughs> yes. always gives, but, <laughs> but, you know, um, but you, you, but, but there are also a lot of what we um, perceive is, is based on sort of faulty data. I mean, if, if you look into uh, the, um, the mechanics behind vision, uh, there's some research to indicate that unless you're looking directly at it, and I believe sometimes even when you're not looking even when you're directly looking at it a lot of the things that are in your peripheral vision are kind of an afterglow of what your your eye remembers being there you know oh so yeah. perception is not reality is basically what it comes down to now to the second part of your question imaginal versus imaginary i, I sort of pulled this from patrick harper who i think uses terminology that's a little bit different but what i like to say is that um Imaginal versus imaginary, the best way to explain it is that imaginal is, uh, how, how did I say it? <laughs> <laughs> um, imaginal is in your head, but not from your head. I think that's what I said. I've got to pull up the PDF now. Um, oh, I actually, I think I have your quote here. Phenomena may be from your head, but not in your head. Right. Yes. Okay. Yes. As so, opposed to imaginary, where you're just making things up. Right. Which is right. Fine, right. but it's yeah. not. But, if you see something, it may be based on what was already in your memory, in your mindset. Right. But it's still you're still having an objective experience with something else. Right. It, it's also a useful way to talk about things that straddle that line between fact and fiction. And this is where a lot of people kind of get upset because they think that you're saying that fiction is reality or that, um, or that UFOs aren't real or something like that. And that's, that's never what I'm saying, but the example, again, to borrow from Patrick Harper is this idea that, uh, that you could be watching a play on stage where let's say that there's a relationship that falls apart, right? And um, none of the people on stage, none of the characters are real. None of the events actually happened. You know, they're being pantomimed before you. Um, you know, technically speaking, uh, none of the emotions for the actors really are, are, are real. Just but watching some strangers be... talk to each other with the scripted lines. Right. In one sense. But in the other sense, it's it can be the most real depiction of, of those emotions um, and the most real depiction of that scenario that has ever occurred, you know, um, and, and the emotions that they, that it elicits in you are genuine uh, to that degree. Oh, absolutely and, and, real. 
and you find this in certain indigenous cultures where there's not uh there aren't separate words for fiction and and a, and, a, and a true story because stories just are and you know i i I still got bills to pay, right? Like it's that's, <laughs> again, that's again, that's not that's not what we're saying. But it's a useful it's a useful way of breaking apart some of these narratives that you're often confronted with when you're looking at the paranormal, especially when you're looking at the UFO field, which you know are often nonsensical, often carry with them imagery that I think could best be described as quasi religious um, mm -hmm. or quasi spiritual, you know, at the very mm -hmm. least. So I think that sort of looking at these things through that lens. Um, and saying, well, you know, did this unfold in a literal reality or did this unfold in some sort of, you know, as Terrence McKenna would say, never, never land. <laughs> uh, but between the two is, 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 I think it's, I think it's a useful model. Yes. It also makes me think of, if it makes me think of a very specific thing that scientists who deal with birds, who, for example, in Wisconsin, we have a big project to train sandhill cranes that are orphaned so they can be functioning adult cranes. And they never let them see the human trainers. They use puppets and, you know, they feed the bird with a hand puppet that looks like a mother bird. And when it finally it's time for them to migrate, they have this ultralight that looks like a big crane. So they won't get attached to following humans. They'll be as close as possible mm -hmm. to what the following natural cranes. If something was going to interact with us, it might not be able to show us its true form. It might need to pluck a image from our you know, either universal consciousness or our specific personal consciousness and say, I'm going to appear as this because you can handle this. Yeah. You can no, handle I... an angel or a, an alien. You can't handle me. I love that because you're bringing back memories of me looking at a National Geographic article in my youth that that had all those things, the puppets and, and the and the ultralight and whatnot. And yeah, the, the, the nor can the cranes under like you know, there's there's a big issue of consent and alien abductions, right? Um, and people say, well, these things must not have our best interests in mind because they don't explain it to us, they don't give us permission, etc. But you know, you're not going to explain to a sandhill crane you know hey you know you're endangered and we're doing this to you know you're, there's there's just no way to even convey that message mm -hmm. um and if you tried to convey that message you'd probably end up harming the crane in some oh yes ways. yeah so I, I i do love that um but i think that's what you know at the end of the day i think that i have sort of had to come I, I've had to become more comfortable with is the idea that this thing, whatever it is, probably is unknowable, at least in this existence. You know what I mean? Um, I think that there might be a time when we all pass away where this all makes perfect sense. And we say, Oh, it was the most <laughs> obvious, most obvious thing ever. Right. Uh, but I think in the interim, uh, I, I'm not entirely sure that we're even capable of, of wrapping our heads around it. Yeah. Yes, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and speaking of which, one of the things, correct me if I'm wrong, you kind of lead with is NDEs. Yeah, um, I, I didn't really have as strong a background in near-death experiences as I really felt like I needed to for Ecology of Souls. Um, so I did what you do, and I got up to speed on, on NDEs. <laughs> Um, but it really was, it really was, um, it was a worthwhile venture because, you know, if you're going to talk about death, you've got to talk about near-death experiences, especially death in the paranormal, right? But uh, I think that near-death experiences are pretty close to being the second hill upon which I will die regarding paranormal phenomenon. The first is, is psi phenomena, right? Like the, the lab work of people like, again, Sheldrake, but also Dean Radin and Daryl Bim is is incredibly compelling and it's oftentimes executed at a level at or better than you know our, our laboratory standards for the efficacy of medications like it's oh they, yes they're they're doing their homework and they're not getting recognized for it so that's that's one of the hills that i'll die upon but you know the near-death experience stuff is is pretty close um 
the problem is it's it's mostly anecdotal um so you have to take people's word for for certain things but there are plenty of examples of you know people who pass away and come back and say hey i saw uncle bob there and they're like but you're kidding me uncle bob's fine he's down in you know tampa <laughs> and they call and they call uncle bob and they're like oh uncle bob uncle bob died while you died <laughs> but somehow you knew that uncle bob was dead just examples like that of of, of people knowing things and having this sort of these sort of inaccessible knowledge is what i call it of of these other extended states of consciousness it's 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 incredibly compelling it really is um, oh yes. And, yes you know when you've got when you've got folks like pin van lommel um publishing papers in the lancet about near-death experiences it's like okay well maybe we should start taking this more seriously as a culture right um but you know what is fascinating is i didn't really intend for this to be sort of the format of the book but you can look at a lot of those hallmarks in the near-death experience things like inaccessible knowledge strange lights um time compression or expansion the the sort of spaces that people wind up in you can take a look at all those and you can apply them to you know near you can apply them to alien abductions and shamanic initiations and you can apply them to um fairy encounters and you can apply them to uh you know even some cryptid encounters it's not always as strong a case to be made there but you know some you can certainly apply them to altered states of consciousness under the influence of psychedelics i mean like all those things are present um so I think that if, if Ecology of Souls has a strength in this regard, it's the fact that, yeah, you know, Kenneth Ring came along and said that uh, UFO experiences look a lot like near-death experiences. And Eddie Bullard came along and said that UFO experiences look a lot like, you know, some of these uh, rites of initiation among, you know, magicians and sh shamans and whatnot and indigenous cultures. But I don't think anybody said has ever really stood back and said hey all these things look like each other like it's just one giant circle in a lot of ways um and the question becomes like you know is is every trip to a different space the same place right so that's and i, I think that's reductive and i don't necessarily ascribe to that myself but you have to ask like well is every alien abduction a trip to the afterlife you know is because i mean if you look at you know the shamanic stuff and again people can quibble over that term um it's best to use culture specific terms for shamans but when you're talking holistically about these sort of ecstatic traditions i just say shaman because it's a simple shorthand um that's it the shamanic initiations that you see amongst these different cultures are almost always explicitly journeys to the brink of death and pushing you past it so that you can come back with newfound abilities guess what happens in the near-death experience you go past that threshold and you come back oftentimes with what people claim are newfound abilities and people transformed have, yes having yeah, and, had a and, real change of life you know having had a true initiation in the full sense that i am now more enlightened and yeah and, see and, and awakening totally yeah. different yeah yeah and awakening yeah and 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 you know similarly like again the the nuts and bolters don't like talking about this but it's it's pretty much a fact if you ascribe to to the alien abduction phenomenon being an actual thing that that people come back from these with heightened abilities or they say that they do or, or you know even if you just see a ufo sometimes you get poltergeist activity in your house you know um it, people don't talk about it but it's been borne out in survey after survey oh yes um, from a variety of different organizations so it and then you find those same things sometimes in cryptid encounters and you certainly find them in you know certain psychedelic trips i mean it's it so it does kind of does kind of all start to sound like the same narrative being repeated over and over again with just different players you know and yes. at some point at some point i i guess i just break down and i say you know contact is contact is contact like you know <laughs> it just seems it's yeah well and someone and i don't have the source for this but years ago at least a decade pointed out that there if you are nuts and bolts on alien abduction it makes no sense they they know all about our bodies. They've done so much testing. They're they're not really testing. They may yeah. pretend the ritual maybe we're abducting you to study you, but they know everything they could possibly want to know. Okay, 100%, 100%. they're not really doing that. Yeah, yeah. The, the the thing that I always go back to is like you know you look at some of the the equipment that they use and it's like it's farcical you know it's like these gigantic drills and these like super intimidating salt you know buzz saws sometimes and these you know scary syringes that you stick up people's noses and i'm like if 
you know, and then a lot of the nuts and bolters will come and say, oh, they're harvesting your, you know, they're harvesting your DNA. And I'm like, well, they can do that with a Q-tip down at CVS, you know, yes, <laughs> or, yes. or you know, they're harvesting your egg and sperm. And I'm like, well, you know, give me a, give me a magazine and a cup. And I can, <laughs> it's just, it's just. Other than that guy in Brazil who had a great time. Oh yeah. The, the other, <laughs> yeah. Villa Boaz. Um, yes. Uh, Every other procedure just seemed really brutal to get the same results. <laughs> yeah, and it's and so and and so you know you can travel hundreds of thousands of light years in the blink mm -hmm. of an eye, but you're still resulting to these invasive methods. It seems to me like it's something more along the lines of theater. Yes, and precisely. Then, it's performative. Yeah, and then you look at like you, and then you take that and you know Graham Hancock did a great job of this in his book Supernatural. Um, although I, th I thought it definitely bared repeating in Ecology of Souls. You know, the most common theme in these shamanic initiations is, is our themes of dismemberment, you know, and you can find accounts, you can compare an account of a Samoyed shaman whose heart has been taken out of his chest, and you can compare that directly to one of John Mack's subjects who said the exact same thing, you know, um, and dismemberment is also something that occurs from time to time in some of these near-death experiences, um, and uh, it's not as strongly illustrated in the in the body of fairy folklore but you know fairies did have a tendency to beat you up and pinch you sometimes um and, and it's it, and it's you know the dismemberment theme finds itself quite frequently into psychedelic trips as well so you know we can continue to silo these things off into their own little camps but we're just when you have like one and if it was just the dismemberment thing, it would be one thing, but you have all these other points of comparison that really make you say, looks like there's something similar going on here. Yes, you know? it really does. You you mentioned presentation, and that made me think of so many UFO sightings where people see a craft. They see a craft that doesn't make any sense to come from an advanced extraterrestrial civilization. We have better stuff. The Air Force has better stuff than what they're <laughs> yeah. they're flying around in. Somebody I, I can't recall was mentioning recently that they'd seen the UFO and they'd seen the rivets. They'd seen that it was bolted the together. Rivets. Like it came yeah. from, you know, yeah. 1960s Detroit. Yeah. Like right yeah. off the assembly line. I was like, I feel alien beings would be doing better than that, you know? Yeah. And, 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 yeah. Well, one and, of and, the who's I'm the gonna... famous director who brilliant director he uh pan's labyrinth um Guillermo del toro yes he had a ufo sighting once and he talked about it and he said he was so unimpressed by what a lackluster ufo came out and he said it had like blinking christmas tree lights it was just it was like crap you know? well, <laughs> he felt i could do better than that you know? yeah and you know you've got you've got those little tidbits like terence mckenna saying that he saw a ufo under the influence of i believe it was psilocybin and he um, said, it, you know, it looked fake as hell and that it looked like it looked like George Adamski's UFO, you know, a proven, yes. a proven hoax UFO. <laughs> but I think it does speak to this co-creation idea that we were talking about earlier, because, you know, this stuff is always just one step ahead of our technology. And it always has been, you know, at, at some point it was people and birds and strange clouds in the sky. But like, if you're just looking at the 20th century, you've got. The airships in the early 20th century, you know, just these steampunk airships that are just Absolutely a little bit. Fascinating. Well, oh, I could conceive of that being terrestrial. And then, you know, you've got the Art Deco flying saucers in the 50s. And then you've got the black triangles that really presaged the stealth bomber era um, in that Belgian wave in the 1980s. And then, you know, nowadays we have these things that look an awful lot like, you know, super advanced drones in a lot of ways. And that just it just fits completely into that narrative. I mean, this is this is old Jacques Vallée territory, but it, it does seem to sort of stay one step ahead of our our current standing uh, with the expectations that it provides us. Yes. As, but that does seem like this is what we want to show you. This isn't yes. really how we get around. This is what we're showing you as a way of you can handle seeing this. You're not going to freak too hard. Yeah, which which also, like, I keep coming back to this. And if there is a thread that kind of runs through all my work, I guess, it might be this, um, since you sort of got me thinking about it, is that a lot of these things do seem engineered to elicit a reaction. You know, that was sort of where I landed with Trojan Feast. It's certainly where I landed to a certain degree with 
brimstone deceit because you know smells you can't help how you feel when you smell when you're triggered by a certain smell like you know Ooh, yeah. anybody who has opened up their you know grandmother's chest of drawers and smelled her <laughs> perfume knows like you know it's it, you you can't tell yourself to not have those memories right so it seems like a lot of this stuff is set deliberately in front of us for some sort of reaction and that sort of open us opens up a whole new area of speculation as to the metaphysical implications of that like you know is is there i i i kind of don't feel very comfortable with these things that people say like oh they feed on our fear and all that sort of thing but i think there might be something to that um to a certain degree because because these things do seem tailor made not only for the individual but tailor made for the individual to have some sort of reaction and of course, you know, if you if you follow that they feed on our fear thing, you end up saying that you know UFOs are alien. Or I'm oh, sorry, you end up saying that aliens are demons, and that's again, I'm sympathetic <laughs> to that idea, but it's it's not. I think it's it's way too reductive for what's actually going on. And not everybody's experience is horrifying. Some people, it's beautiful, and some people, it's just weird. You know. Well, and you know, it comes back to that those questions that we had earlier about it, being able to understand what the motivations are. I mean, you know, like, you know, you know, does your dog hate the vet? You know, you know, <laughs> is is the vet good for your dog? You know, so um, th- there's this idea that we might not be able to comprehend the how beneficial this whatever this is to us is. Um, again, not taking away from people who've had generally harrowing experiences of her. Oh yeah, so, I mean, myself. Um, mm-hmm. but. Uh, but yeah, there there does seem to be a loose trend. I mean, you know, if you look at someone like Ray Hernandez's free study that he put together with the Edgar Mitchell Foundation, he would make the strong case that these things tend to be positive and that even negative interactions tend to be viewed over time in a positive light. Which, you know, Stockholm Syndrome maybe, but um, but I think there's a case to be made that these experiences do seem to be um, transcendent in some sort of way that tends to be beneficial and then you know that's another thing it might be a question that you have on the on the docket here but um you know the writing ecology of souls did change my idea on on death uh as long as we're talking about negative outcomes right because oh, like, yes, that's, yes. that's the ultimate negative outcome right like this thing's gonna kill you um but once you get once you start looking at death and once you sort of live with all this death literature for a year um you do end up starting to say to yourself, well, that's really not so bad. Like, you know, like, like no, I, I fully get what you're saying that yeah. it is an inescapable part of nature. Yeah. And whether you believe that you are going to come back through reincarnation or whether you believe you're going on to a different, totally different afterlife. Um, and even for what it's worth, if you're a diehard materialist reductionist and you just think it's it's over, it's nonetheless part of nature, an inescapable part. And if we can make a peace with it, I think we'd all be a lot healthier. Oh, I, I, t- I totally agree. And and to sort of piggyback off of what you're saying, that's something that will sort of underscore what I, what I was getting at, too, is, um you know, for, for those of us who have afterlife beliefs, like, okay, well, obviously death isn't the worst thing that can happen to you. Like, non-existence <laughs> is. But even if you don't have those beliefs, I mean, you can think of a, a thousand things that are worse than death. You know, the thing that I always come keep coming back to is, um, you know, accidentally killing someone else. Like, that's, that's even if I didn't believe in an afterlife, that would be worse than Just death dealing for with, me. Yes, the guilt um, of doing something horrible. Oh, yeah, or, yeah or, or, you know, betraying family members and loved ones um you know squandering potential i mean these are all things that i think are are worse than death so you know if you're facing down sasquatch in the pacific northwest and he's about to rip your arms limb from limb <laughs> like is death really the worst thing you know and <laughs> and again like we used to have an idea for this you know the the, the egyptians would speak of Amit, who was uh, the the soul devourer you know and you die and Anubis would take you to the afterlife and there'd be a trial and your heart would be weighed against a feather. If it was deemed heavier than a feather, yeah. Uh your 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 existence, your very self would be thrown into the the maw of a 
part crocodile, part hippopotamus, part lion, and you just wouldn't exist. You know, you just cease to exist. So, yeah, there there do seem to be things worse than death. And once you have that stuck in your mind, it's like, well, how how bad can these abductions really be? You know, because they don't even. I mean, I'm sure there you can find exceptions in the literature, um, but for the most part, these experiences don't kill people. You know. Um, they might leave them traumatized, which is something of a personal um, sticking point for me. I, I argue that there are very few people in the world who um, are whose ridicule is sanctioned as readily, and who do who do not have a support network or anyone speaking up for them as much as paranormal experiencers. Um, that is very true. And, that and, is and, so likely to just be dismissed out of hand. Well, you know, you say this to some people, and they're like, "Oh, there are marginalized groups." I'm like, "Yeah, but the, there are people who are speaking up for them. Like for for the paranormal experiencer who is genuinely traumatized, like it's completely okay to laugh at them as kooks, and no one is going to come to their rescue. No one's going to speak up for them. And the thing that I, you have to realize is that even if the person, you, you know, the best case scenario is that you're like making fun of someone who had an actual terrifying experience with something unknown, and the worst case scenario is that you're actually making fun of someone with mental health issues you know or, or either or one because, is atrocious yeah. yes well and because the trauma is real right yes. um regardless of whether or not the event is real the trauma is real so um where was i going with this <laughs> um so 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 yeah i think that these events even though they don't kill you we're talking about negative events um and you're left with trauma i think that really becomes the key is is how well you end up integrating it you know you've got to just like any sort of trauma you've got to deal with it or it's going to eat your lunch you know i will say this on behalf of mental health professionals i i i have ptsd that's not anything i've tried to keep secret i i don't know if i've mentioned it to you or not. i think i probably have at some point but it doesn't matter um i see a psychiatrist and a psychologist not for anything paranormal, for things that happen in the all too real world. But both were very, when they asked me, well, what do you do with your time? Uh, well, I do a paranormal podcast. And I'm like, the good thing I didn't lead with that. <laughs> but no, both were very sympathetic. The MD psychiatrist immediately goes into the story where a medium put him in touch with his late father and, you know, oh, it was, it was a wonderful experience. It changed my life. And the the PhD psychologist, who is of Middle Eastern descent, um, we've talked about the jinn. Like, <laughs> that, and not in a, like, oh, that's ridiculous way, but, you know, no, there might be something there way. And it a lot of them are professionals tend to be more accepting. It's like kind of the media and the public that are dismissive. Yeah, it's well, it's it's also the um, yeah. I mean, it's so I I've I have thoughts. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I think what a lot of people fail to see is that even if you don't believe in this stuff or think there's an objective reality to it, it's still a useful way of looking at the human condition. You know what I mean? Well, absolutely. Um, and I've I've spoken with some skeptics, the skeptics that I tend to get along with the most, because like I, I have I'm more skeptical than people would think. Um, they 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 tend to realize that, and they find it fascinating, you know that 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 we talk about monsters all the same way, you know, from culture to culture, right? Mm -hmm. Um, but the other thing that I will say is that people have a lot more weird experiences than they realize, and I don't know. I'm I'm eager to hear your take on this, um, because my sense in the past three or four years talking about the ufo topic and this might partially be due to the pentagon stuff and due to all the sort of um congressional hearings and whatnot but the conversation has opened up in a really fascinating way and it's surprisingly enough not opened up regarding ufos specifically to the extraterrestrial hypothesis you know um i'll never forget speaking to a, a, a therapist of mine about ufos and uh you know when they found out i was interested in it they said oh yeah i think they're interdimensional and i'm like what <laughs> like, like yeah the idea that that would <laughs> that's be a relief well the, the, well then the notion that that idea that sort of egoism would be so mainstreamed uh in the 2020s is quite surprising to me oh yeah um, 
and you know, I think it's real so, progress for what it's worth. I think it is too. I mean, you know, I, I, I um. I don't think that there's necessarily anything virtuous in looking at UFOs as interdimensional, but at the same time, it does imply that there's more open-mindedness out there than we're led to believe if we turn on the TV and look at any other issue, right? Yes, um, yes. So, yeah, I, I think that the, I don't know if you've experienced that with talking with um with about UFOs with with the normal folk um, as well, but it's been something that I've noticed because even recently, um, I was. I was part of a I was part of a church group, um, and you know I, I don't really bring I'm a I'm a practicing Christian, but I don't really bring up what I do. <laughs> I imagine I really, yeah. that might be yeah. the hardest audience. It can it can be an odd audience, um, but no, this church group is totally into it, and like, um, you know, the one of the guys in the group was reading a Michael Heiser book, um, and. Uh, you know they 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 watch Skinwalker Ranch every week, and I'm like, <laughs> okay, this is this has gotten you know sort of mainstreamed in an interesting way that you have you know members of a non-denominational church who um are sort of straddling that who who aren't buying into the idea that it's demons and aren't buying into the idea that it's that it's aliens. You know what I mean? Yes. Um, they're they're not falling into the, or, or that it's all bunk, right? They're not falling mm-hmm. into any of those extremes. They're really sitting with. The information and saying uh, this is interesting and i you know i'm going to keep it at arm's length which i think anybody should do to a certain degree mm-hmm. stay healthy but like it's interesting i'm going to keep it at arm's length and i'm going to i'm going to leave the jury out for a while while i try to decide what i think is going on with this um and it was just it was, it was a really interesting moment yes and that is i'm sounds like you're in a supportive church that's a good place to be um because a lot of people might not be as receptive though the Catholics. Well, um, I'm not about to stand up on Sunday and make any announcements, but <laughs> <laughs> if, if you get people one on one, yes, then, and that's yeah, often yeah. the case. Yeah. Um, and if you just look at if you believe in a creator, whatever the details are, if you believe in a creator who created bill, in Carl Sagan's word, billions and billions of um planets and galaxies that we can't even can't even perceive with our most powerful telescopes the idea that we're the only life form and it just i'll make some life here and that's it 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 becomes ludicrous i I can't imagine accepting that you know oh yeah i mean that's that's the trap that that people sometimes that you sometimes fall into when you talk about this with people because they say well you don't think that ufos are aliens are you saying that you don't believe that there's life out there Oh no! And it's like no, yes, that's, that's exactly. not that's not what I'm saying at all. <laughs> that's not what I'm saying at all. I just don't think they commute. <laughs> right, right. Uh, one thing you brought up that I found interesting, and I wanted to make sure because there's no the volume you've produced, we're not going to be able to touch on anything like half of what's in there. But I, there's certain things I wanted to make sure to touch on. You mentioned. Um, NDEs, shamanic experiences, abductions, and psychedelic experiences, all kind of side by side. What what are your thoughts on psychedelics? Well, I haven't used any, and it's not just because oh, I didn't mean it that way. <laughs> <laughs> it's not just because mom might be listening. Um, I mean, honestly, part of me is too, pardon my French, too chicken shit to do it. Um, but part of oh, me also no, is, I, I've never touched it either because um, I don't think it'd be a good fit, you know? Yeah. And you know, it's, it's not like it's, they're safer than we've been led to believe, but that doesn't mean that they're safe. You know what I mean? Um, yes. And I, I say that purely from like a mental health standpoint, like I'm not sure that I would come out of that hole because there are people who should not do these things. <laughs> you know yes. what I mean? Um, but um So your your question on what I think of them, meaning what's happening there, or I guess, in other words, if you take hallucinogens, are you really perceiving something outside of your own brain, or are you just getting a hallucination from chemicals? Right. Well, I'd probably quibble with just the term hallucinogen in general, because I think if you look at things like henbane and uh, some of those other psychoactive substances, they, they do tend to be more hallucinogenic rather than psychedelic. Um, 
and I think that that distinction is usually drawn on the sort of I want to say objective reality of it, but they they tend to they tend to manifest things that are a little bit more aligned with what we would think of as hallucinations. Um, I, I think with psychedelics, it's it's there's more of an implication of of transition um, and and boundary dissolution. I would say so. The question becomes like you know objective subjective. What are we doing with here? And and what I sort of the the way that I sort of ended up wrestling with that and and the way that i ended up trying to draw that line is, is to look at something like dreams right i mean you know you have you have these big dreams and you have little dreams so yes just as you might have a dream where your aunt is wearing a peanut butter and jelly sandwich on her head while she dances the can can that probably doesn't mean anything right <laughs> and and you might have you might have a trip that's like that right it might just be the a, a frivolous nonsensical thing but you might also have a dream where you know some of my favorite some of my favorite ghost stories are, are about this you know where where a ghost comes back and reveals the location of a hidden will or you know the um, oh. or you know their um their murderer or something like that like th those are those are substantial substantively different dreams and i think that psychedelics which probably again not to be completely reductive and say it's all the same space but probably access that same realm um because you know there's this long-standing connection between dreams and sleep and death as well um psychedelics that that sort of access that same realm might be of a more important um quality and i think so i think that would be a, a place to draw this di the distinction because you can't treat you know you can't treat a bunch of sophomores in their dorm room taking psilocybin the same way that you can somebody who has gone on a dieta in you know Peru and is is taking ayahuasca for spiritual growth. Like these are these are fundamentally different things. And it you know as to why those things tend to come out in different ways, they it probably I would guess that it has a lot to do with setting set and setting. Um, you know, there's there's some degree of of data to suggest that set and setting also might play a role in some of these UFO abductions. Um, hmm. If you think you're going to have a bad experience, you're probably going to have a bad experience. <laughs> you might be able to change. You might be able to change the quality of the experience during the experience by adjusting your expectations. Um, I've seen I've seen a loose trend for that. I don't have any hard numbers. Um, so I think that that also probably plays a role. Like it's it's whatever is on the other side of this says okay they, they actually they, they're actually ready for this. Like this isn't recreational. They're actually ready for it. So, um. And I suspect that in some cases they they do send your consciousness to another place. Um, again, not always, but I suspect that they do. And, and I have to wonder, I entertain this idea of whether or not um, the inverse also happens. So uh, one of my favorite details in entity reports is how often they look surprised as surprised as the witnesses do. I'm sure you've noticed this too. Yes, right? yes. Like, oh, you can see us. And, and I kind of wonder if there isn't, um, you know, if uh, Bigfoot's not dropping acid in another dimension and pops in <laughs> over here, you know, <laughs> and, and that's, that's sort of reductive and silly, but I kind of wonder if, if there's not, um, you know, that sort of, that sort of two-way transmission that's happening sometimes. I've often wondered if it's not a disorienting and even frightening experience for them, if they wander through the porthole and... I mean, well, you know, that, that's, that was one of Terrence McKenna's things that he would talk about was that, uh, that, you know, the only reason that we don't perceive our waking life as psychedelic is because we're in it all the time, you know, and he had the sense that if you could just remain in the DMT realm, it would have as much logic as, as our world does here. Um, wow. So to that extent, like, yeah, this might be a, a psychedelic world that we're in right here. It's just someone else's psychedelic world, you know? Um, machine elves machine get, get, yeah. get good high and show up in, in your living room <laughs> yeah um yeah yeah so uh i i think you also might be able you know, you're talking about the distinctions between hallucinogens and and uh psychedelics i think that if you were to go a little bit deeper and sort of look at the neural pathways upon which these things work you might also see sort of a distinction between the two um you know i am i'm a big fan of the idea that um 
DMT dimethyltryptamine um, might well be the um, rocket ship that sort of puts our consciousness in a different place. Um, we all carry it. It's the most potent, most potent psychedelic, and we all carry it in our heads. We still don't completely know why it's there. Um, there's some indication that it might be in small amounts in the pineal gland, but the working theory is that a substantial enough dump of DMT might actually facilitate paranormal experiences. When you look at the fact that a lot of research, even in scientific circles, is pointing to the fact that there's a DMT dump at death, it does sound like rocket fuel to me. It sounds like what you need mm -hmm. to achieve escape velocity from one life into the other. Um, you know, one of the most fascinating things about Rick Strassman's work was, I will believe it was 49 days, um, 49 days into a fetus's development was when the Buddhists said that a soul entered the child and, um, that's also when the pineal gland finally forms. Um, wow. An interesting little correlation there, which does suggest like this is this is how you get from here to there, you know. Um, and the fact that substances, even like uh, if if memory serves, so anybody who's an expert on this, please forgive me. I've got I wrote down the book somewhere, but um, psilocybin also act, act, act um, also acts on similar pathways as well. Does suggest to me like this is this is the real deal. Um, and uh, that uh, it, it might be the facilitator for paranormal experiences and also the facilitator for us to, to come and go. Um, even, even when we don't intend to come and go. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And I guess maybe the way I phrased that came off as like anti-psychedelic, which no, I'm, I'm just, I know they're using psychedelics in experimental research and has have had some fantastic reports in helping to heal PTSD, helping to get people out of addiction, it kind of people who are stuck in a rut, it being a thing that can be very uplifting under the right circumstances. Yeah, no, and, and, and most of what I've been, well, why I keep on harping on is because I made the statement that things like henbane were, were hallucinogens versus psychedelics, and I can't remember where I heard that and why that argument was made, so I kept on trying to reinforce <laughs> that was why I made that assertion. But I do know that there's some people in, in the, the extended consciousness circuit who do make that distinction. Um, but I think the simplest answer is, is going back to that idea of comparing them to something like dreams. I mean, you know, I, um, I mean, you can say that about a lot of different, a lot of these different contact experiences, right? Some seem profound and sometimes you get space pancakes, you know? Yes, yes <laughs> like, indeed. Like, it's, it's just, yeah. <laughs> That's very much the case. There, there is such a, and I frankly find the, the goofy ones to be the most interesting. Sometimes, oh no, totally. <laughs> like I, I am. Um, so this is something that uh, I've heard other people say, but I, I like the way that I say it better. Um, when somebody comes to me and they say that they've had an alien abduction, and you know, I was taken up in a light, and they experiment on me, and they drop me off back at home, and this and that, and the other, and it's all very rote. I'm like, okay, maybe that happened. But when they're like, yeah, I. I was taken up in a light and I wound up aboard this craft and one of the aliens was wearing a shirt that said, I heart New York. <laughs> that's, that's when I'm like, Oh, okay. This is probably because, you know, I, that's, that's one of the reasons that I love high strangeness is because it's always so absurd that it's like, there's no reason somebody would make this up. You know? Yes. There's that, um, that kicker, that thing that is the odd, which sometimes seems intentional that we're gonna, we're gonna do something weird so nobody takes this too seriously yeah yeah um that that great quote from the herbert Shermer abduction in nebraska you know we want you to believe in us but not too much yeah. yes yes which if i can just circle around a little bit is kind of what they were doing with the cranes that we don't want you to see us because we don't want you to for lack of a better term we don't want you to worship us we want you yeah. to be good human beings, not develop a cult over us, because it's not about us. It's about you taking the next step. Yeah, yeah. No, I love that. I love that. You know? um, although, you know, sometimes it does seem like they're trying to start a cult, or whatever these things are. I mean, <laughs> that's that's the thing that really surprised me when sort of looking at it with this eye is that um, the number of the number of 
even very conventional, you know, late 80s, early 90s abductions by UFO greys, the number of those narratives that contain some sort of spiritual garnish is really quite striking, you know, that these, these are not the, um, these are not Arthur C. Clarke's emissaries of atheism that come from. Oh, no. Time and again, they're preoccupied with your soul and, you know, they'll talk about what you need to do to, to raise your consciousness and vibration. And, you know, they're, they're, it's just, it's, it's all very, you know, it's, it's all very spiritual. Um, and that, you know, there, there are certain people in, in my religion who would view that with a lot of skepticism and, you know, again, have that knee jerk reaction of, of, of demons, but I, I don't necessarily ascribe that to, to that myself. Um, and, you know, that's, you were talking about sort of the genesis of, of ecology to begin with, and that's part of what it was too. I mean, it, uh, you keep hearing these stories about like the stories that I never wanted to touch, right. Where like the reincarnation stories and alien abductions <laughs> and like the pre-birth memories, you know, where I was a ball yes. of light aboard an alien craft. They're like, Oh God, what do I do with this? <laughs> um, not, not because it like offended me. I just, I just didn't know what to do with it. Like, you know, um, so I was like, okay, well, push where there's mush and uh, figure <laughs> out a way to make this work. Uh, and then the final like reason why I did this is just so I could work through a lot of this stuff myself with my own you know, spirituality. I think that if you, you know, there's there's like a <laughs> there's like a third or fourth book um, in Ecology of Souls that if you read it with that in mind, um, you kind of see me trying to figure out what to do with this you know as a christian person um now that's not to say that it's a it's an explicitly christian book the best compliment that mm -hmm. i have gotten the best compliment that i have gotten is like i wouldn't have known you were a christian until the afterward <laughs> like perfect <laughs> that's exactly you know i wanted to be very divorced and very sort of clinical about it but um mm -hmm. yeah there is an afterward where i'm just like what you know it's the question on everybody's it's a question on my mind at least you know what what do you do with this or what do i do with this um and how does it interface with yeah, my own faith. Um, yeah. Uh, the yeah, the questions would be obvious, um, and some not so obvious. But yes, there there would be a lot there. Well, you um, know, one easy out is that like a lot of what we think we know about the afterlife from like that sort of Judeo Christian world is mostly like early church fanfic. You know what I mean? It's like Dante, and it's. Oh yes, yes, it's not really rooted in anything theologically. And if you actually, you know, if if you're a Christian, you look at the Bible. Like, there's not a lot of clarity on what happens after death, and there certainly isn't a lot of clarity on the mechanics of what happens. And I think that I suspect that for my own, for my own, um, you know, for my own needs, um, that's what ecology of souls is more about. It's not about necessarily the meaning as much as it's about the mechanics of of that transition. Yes. And that kind of leads me to something that's really an important part of, of your book. Um, the idea that it, at least one possibility is that the dead aren't inactive just because they're no longer in a physical form, a physical suit, that they have their own world. And I think this is very a big idea in Africa, um, traditionally, that they do stuff. And that they have their own lives and that they have their own societies and they're going about, <laughs> they're busy in the afterlife. Yeah, it is It is not something that is palatable to Westerners, I can tell you that. You know, we, we like to think you die and you go to a cloud and you just hang out, whatever. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a very common idea. It was common in uh, ancient China. It was common um, most prominently in, in Egypt, I know of, um, where, you know, in the Tuat, it was basically just like Earth again. And you had to... <laughs> you got up and you ate and you slept and you worked in the fields and you worshiped and you did all the things that you would just do here. Um, and, you know, as you mentioned, it's just, it's just something that's, it's an indigenous idea that we don't have a lot of experience with, but what that does certainly raise the possibility of, and this is a whole new, whole interesting angle to pursue is the idea of you know, technological advancement or what we would call technological advancement or progress of any sort on the other side. Um, and this is an idea that uh, was actually played with surprisingly early in ufology. You could find references to this idea as far back as the 50s. If you look at, you know, those old flying saucer reviews, um, which are always more open to the, 
the um the psychic component of ufos than anything in the states were um but uh it was this idea that yeah maybe these are are vehicles to to go to and from the afterlife and you know interestingly enough you, you do find that indications of that hints of that in uh some of the work of uh of whitley streber um but you know one of my favorite examples was uh you know uh Constantine Radove, a famous you know EVP pioneer, um, supposedly um, came back and left numerous voice recordings. Um, yes, this I have work. heard of it. It's yeah, fascinating. On, on researcher Sarah Eastep's answering machine, and you can look up the recordings. And if you listen to them, it's I can't obviously you know attest to the authenticity of them, but it's it's an uncanny thing to hear for sure. It, it, yes, and I think you mentioned briefly at one point that the airships might be voyages by the dead to come back and like tourist through our world <laughs> i don't know if i mentioned that but that's a great idea um <laughs> and if i did mention it, i'm proud of myself for mentioning it <laughs> but it doesn't ring it doesn't ring a bell off the top of my mind i mean i would i would have to think from from what I can tell, I would have to I would well, I would tend to think that there would be some sort of mission implied <laughs> on on a on a on a on a, a trip from one from the afterlife or the other world or if you want to call it into our world, but um, not necessarily so I guess, um. And uh, yeah, I do love the idea of 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 the dead returning on a steampunk airship. That's just like the most <laughs> quaint thing I've ever. I love it. Yes. <laughs> Something that yeah. they would be comfortable with, and and, the, and and that we would be comfortable with, like you know, yes, yeah, yeah, and perhaps not even on. They might their technology might run in a totally different track from ours, and they might right. not be aware they don't use these anymore. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so I mean, and, floating and, along, and, and and there is this implication, like, I mean, if 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 we are if that part of us is indeed energy, then it completely makes sense that there would be some level of technological interface, right? And the you know the parapsychological literature is littered with examples of you know telephone calls from the dead and you know things things of that sort. So, and and surprisingly enough, like people don't talk about this, but um, some of the earliest uh, people who some of the people indeed who are who are credited with like discovering EVPs, it was kind of one of those things where like ten people discovered it around the same time. You know what I mean? Like there are certain oh, yes. points in history, certain points in history when everybody kind of discovers the same thing, but um. There are some individuals who are credited or are listed among the discoverers of EVP um, who believe that some of their first transmissions were, you know, interceptions of, of extraterrestrials. And to this day, ghost hunters uh, will pick up things that they say are not um, spirits, but are actually aliens. Now, whether or not they are, there's that's completely unfalsifiable. Oh, yeah, but, but, but it's interesting to look at that interpretation Um of, again, it's just another example of these things using the same vectors, regardless of what category we want to put them in. Yeah. Yes. Well, I think it's noteworthy that both Thomas Edison and Nikola Tesla seriously worked on a telephone-like device to talk to the dead. And they took that totally seriously. Neither yeah. one claimed to have succeeded, but they right. both thought it was like something that could happen. They didn't think it was ridiculous at all. You know? Right. Um <laughs> No, you, you know that, that's 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 definitely the case, and and there's some more. Um, I kind of had a had a thing where I wanted to like do a book after Ecology of Souls on like afterlife tech, like oh. technology technology that's made on the on the other side. But I think that, that um, Nathan Isaacs of the Penny Royal podcast is sort of starting to go down that route with some of his research, judging by a, a presentation that I saw recently. So, um, but suffice to say this. From what he shared and what I can tell, um, and I'm not being coy. I just I'm, I'm saying no. like that as I'm, I'm saying that in terms of like what I remember. Um, <laughs> from what from what he shared and what I can tell, um, this idea is is alive and well in uh, places like Silicon Valley. It's just not oh. talked about as much. Yeah, openly, yes. I'm sure they talk right, about it with right. each other. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Probably relentlessly. <laughs> publicly, publicly talked about it. <laughs> yes. Um. And I guess, I mean, there's no harm in, in touching on it. Um, you had access to um, what 
the the things that were mailed to Whitley Schreiber? No, no. So so the original plan was to uh, go down to Rice University and roll up my sleeves and go into the archives of the Impossible and go through the the correspondence. Um, yes. and I did. And uh, when I started writing this, it was still a very COVIDy time, <laughs> so. Mm. That did not get to happen. Um, that was part of the plan. Um, uh, so, but you know, looking back on it, so part of me is sort of regretful that I didn't get to do that because you'd think that if Anne came to that conclusion, um, that there would be plenty of evidence, plenty of great cases in those letters oh, yeah. that have stories of the dead. Uh, I did not amazed with people must have sent some bizarre I, stuff and, and and so that's the other thing is that like it, it probably saved my bacon because knowing knowing the knowing my tendency for completionist completionism <laughs> I, it probably would have driven me mad um uh because i get the you know, i'm not sure i'll have the chance to, to poke around i guess um here in a couple of weeks but i get the impression that it's like tens of thousands of letters oh wow um, uh yeah and uh so um what i ended up doing was just compiling as many examples as i could uh to sort of give a cross section of the types of dead that are encountered in alien abductions because that was one that was one of the reasons why ann streber came to that conclusion that this has something to do with what we call death so i put together three appendices in the ecology of souls companion that were uh people who were dead who were known to the experiencer during or around the time of contact, um, people who were dead who were not known to the experiencer uh, during or around the time of contact. And uh, the third one was, I can't remember the third appendix. This has been the first interview I've done in a long time. <laughs> no. um, I can't remember the third one. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll look it up here in a second. But um, the, the appendix B is the one that, those who were dead and were not known, which is kind of an odd thing. Like you say, how did the people not know that they were dead? But it's what I mean by that is people who learned that someone aboard the craft said that they were dead, or you know, in one really interesting case from South Dakota, um, they provided a name to oh yeah researchers, yeah, of someone who uh, said that they were dead that they had never met and ended up you know being verified as as having died and you know they had never met. Oh, Appendix, that's right, that's what I thought. Appendix C is UFOs seen in cemeteries and graveyards. Um, okay. So anyway, I still wound up with like three chunky appendices just compiled from my from my books and such. Um, and, you know, that's it's sort of what I use to shut down or open, sh shut down the conversation or open up the conversation, depending on which direction I want it to go in. Um, whenever people are adamant about the extraterrestrial hypothesis, I say, okay, well, why why are people seeing dead loved ones in alien abductions? Um, that, because... is, that is a real, that's a, a collision that you can't have if they're coming from Alpha Centauri. That, yeah, that just wouldn't yeah. be. Well, you know, they're the probably. people who say, they're the people, they're the, they're the people who say screen memories because, you know, screen memories Screen memories and in, in ufology saying that is like saying infrasound and in Bigfoot research. Like whenever you need an explanation for something strange, everything. you say screen memories. But um, if you take it on face value, then at the very least, you wind up with really, really weird extraterrestrials. You know what I mean? Um, uh, so yeah, um, it's 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 something that makes people at least stop and say, "What? That's a thing." <laughs> you know, and yes. then they'll say. And then they'll say, "Oh, these those people are crazy." I'm like, "Well, you don't get to pick and choose who's crazy in in, in this field. Like, it just doesn't work." Yes, that that's um, <laughs> just because it doesn't conform to your own personal pet uh, interpretation of the phenomenon. Yeah, that is very very interesting. Wow, um, there is a ton of material that we could cover, but um, there is. <laughs> Time may be an illusion, but we're living in it <laughs> tonight. <laughs> I did want to ask you a couple other things um, before it got too late. And I, you know, um, we both kind of ran out of time. Um, let's see. I think you mentioned kind of the, the research that you 
did changed how you perceived death. And without, you know, dragging something deep out from within yourself, just how how would you say you look at it differently now? Well, it's it's the uh, for me it's that idea that it's not the worst thing that can happen to you. Um uh it also is it was it was encouraging or comforting i guess to see the amount of of near death experience literature that's out there because i you know obviously being in these circles i'm i'm i was always pretty well acquainted with it but i was never um immersed in it like i was with this and to see so many common narratives emerge um and so many similar um similar narratives i think was was really inspirational especially again when once when they when they have so many commonalities presented across different cultures um and even in cultures that don't sort of ascribe to the you know love and light near death experience that we're all familiar <laughs> with they still yes. report the love and light near death experience that we're all familiar with right um gregory shushan a near death experience scholar provides an example of, I believe it's the Zuni, um, who in, in there in some of the, some of the Zuni near death experiences um, that he examined, they seem to still have that uh, some of the hallmarks that we associate with near death experiences today. So you know, there's those aspects. There's the aspect that like you know, death really isn't that bad of a thing, um, but also. Uh, the other thing that it really sort of crystallized in my in my mind is, uh, you know, my editor Barbara Fisher um, said, you know, Josh, it's it's not really about death. Like it's about death and and, and life. You know, it's about death and rebirth. Um, and really situating those as as two sides of the same coin is something that um, I think we could use a lot more of. Um, yeah, and, and thinking of it like more like respiration, and then thinking of it as you know something with a finite beginning and a finite end, I think is really important. I'm quite sympathetic to you know reincarnation. I think that uh, you know the third hill that I'll die on. I'm ordering them, you know, sign your death experience. <laughs> yes. The third hill that I'll die on is um, reincarnation studies. Um, the work of uh, Jim Tucker and Ian, Ian Stevenson at the University of uh, Virginia some really great research uh, again there's always that quote-unquote anecdotal quality that you can't escape from but some of it does really seem to suggest that reincarnation uh, has some sort of objective reality so that is a hill on which i will join you um yeah I absolutely mean, it's, it's, yeah yeah it's it's just it's such a it's not a universal idea but it's a very widespread idea and there is this sort of we good efforts have been made towards verifying it and uh it just seems so logical um in a lot of ways you know the thing yes. that i the thing that i realize is that you know even the the sort of materialist mantra of you know we are star stuff is is a reincarnative philosophy you know? yes. um so even if you take that route like it's reincarnation is still kind of a thing folks um <laughs> so yeah i think that's that's something else that it, it really did um solidify in my mind is is how uh, these are not, it's not a segmented line, you know, it's a circle. Yeah. Yes. And that, and that's kind of the, would you say, and I'm just ad-libbing here, but that one thing you see with NDEs is very few people who are dying in a non, like not in a shootout or going over a cliff in a car, but who are having the near-death experience in a hospital, say very few go out in a panic. They go out peacefully. They go out as this is not yeah, a horrible and, end. Yeah, yeah. And 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 I think even more to that, I think an even better way of sort of illustrating the point that you're driving at is uh to a person they they don't want to return. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like to a person <laughs> interesting, to, yes, yeah, to be to a, back. <laughs> yeah. To a person they get back and they're like, oh hell, this is not fun. <laughs> like this is not where I want to be. Um <laughs> you know in in a in a in a perverse sort of way, uh 
there are those negative near-death experiences um which mm-hmm. are sort of like all bad experiences they are affirming in and of themselves right because that's that's really unless you've unless you've hit a rock bottom in your life you don't really understand the transformative power of negativity um or not negativity but like you don't understand the ne- the transformative power of desperation and 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 the and the potential for rebirth that can come out of that right so um in that sense the near death experiences that are negative of which there are plenty not as many as the positive ones but there are plenty um do have that sort of affirming power all into themselves um because i th- i think it further suggests that there is a um an objective quality to these things the fact that they're all not you know I mean, you know, if if it's just the the flailing of a dying brain, why would you create? Why would you fashion such a depressing <laughs> place yes. to be in your, your yes. final moments? You know what I mean? Um, and of course, you know the implication that you know if there's something so profoundly dark, there must be something profoundly dark on the other end of the spectrum. So yeah, um, yeah, I I find negative NDEs uh, to be fascinating. Um, and. I don't, I guess I don't know. Are we talking about the ones where people go to hell? Um, yeah, yeah, but it's, it's very, you know, it's, it's, it's probably very, more complicated than yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's very rarely, um, it's very rarely little red guys with pitchforks and flames, you know what I mean? It's the themes that you find are, you know, um, masses of those wailing in pain, um, sometimes creature attacks, um, but most often, you know, the themes that I tend to notice are, you know, cold, dark, uh, loneliness, you know, which is one Christian interpretation of hell is that it's it's just the absence of God. You know, it's just you, you are completely alone. Um, so, yeah, uh, the most famous one uh, that's gotten the most publicity is, is Howard Storm, um, who was uh, an atheist. And that's not might not necessarily be why he went to to hell because there are atheists <laughs> who have had positive near-death experiences but he was he was an atheist and he um was self-admitted a, a very negative individual and he had a duodenal perforation while on a field trip to paris he was an art teacher and uh he basically these entities were like whispering him you know to, coaxing him out of a hospital room and he thought you know he was just in the hospital he had actually you know was dying or dead i guess clinically and uh they coaxed him out of the, into the hospital hallway and you know kept on leading him farther and farther and farther and then like you know it, it gets misty and gray and then all the lights go out and he's being basically devoured alive um oh, you know another, oh. another one another one of those shamanic motifs right that's that's a strong shamanic motif is the, is the idea of being devoured by something and uh then he he barely remembers just the little the little snippets of jesus loves me he just remembers that bit from from sunday school so he just says jesus loves me jesus loves me he's saying that over and over again and uh these bright warm presences um uh come to him and they surround him like a couple of different a couple of different lights you know the usual stuff of incredibly bright to look at but not painful to look at you know those old hallmarks that you hear and uh that's when he, they have a I was going to say this without, I was going to say this without a hint of irony, but I can't now. They, they have a come to Jesus with them, right? Okay. <laughs> um, they have a literal come to Jesus with them. <laughs> um, and they, you know, they're, they're, um, they're, you know, talking him through everything that he's done in his life and how he has been a negative person. And that's when he gets, a little, I think he got a life review, um, but he also get, you know, some quasi apocalyptic warnings for the future of the world. Again, another thing that you see in alien abductions all the mm-hmm. time. Uh, and then he was brought back and had a complete change of heart, and I believe is a I believe he's a United Church of Christ minister now. Um, but he also like he had some strange fallout in the aftermath of that. He had some complications from the surgery and strange visitors that would enter the room that no one else could see, and just some some peripheral um, post into East strangeness. But that's that's by far one of the most famous. That happened, I believe, if memory serves, in like the 90s or maybe the early 2000s. Um, but, you know, if, if, once you look through it, you can start seeing that there are here and there negative near-death experiences to the extent that Raymond Moody, who, you know, was a real, was a real near-death experience pioneer, actually uh, incorporated, uh, actually revised his, uh, his hallmarks of the near-death experience to include sort of a land of the uh 
restless dead uh, as, as one possible modality yeah wow that is that is fascinating um to totally change to something and now for something completely different um i am i realize i have um borrowed copiously of your time and i do really appreciate it um we should probably kind of wrap things up. I like just got a couple more things I'd like to ask you. Um, when you're not researching the paranormal and writing about it, you're a musician. Um, have you noticed any crossover in those two worlds? Yeah. So, um, you know, I always have this saying that, you know, sometimes I feel like I'm the, the odd duck out every time, everywhere I go, because, you know, all my UFO friends are like, well, you play the tuba? And <laughs> all my musician friends are like, what's up with the UFO thing? Um, I've noticed a couple things, you know, there's that openness to, uh, to these phenomena. It's also an openness to alternative interpretations amongst these communities, which I never would have expected. Another thing that I'll never forget is, um, you know, drinking with bandmates after a gig and at 2 a.m. one guy says, so what do you think about UFOs? And it's like, oh, God. Um, <laughs> and then another time, I think, I think, but I think another bandmate jumped in and she said, it all has to do with consciousness. And I was like, okay. You know, so, so they're, they're, you're they're setting these, me up here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're, 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 they're these, there's, there are people who are sort of into this stuff and, and interested in these other ideas. But I will say like on a firsthand sort of experience, um, you know, we were talking about the Rupert Sheldrake stuff and the morphic resonance stuff. And I, I, when you play with people for long enough, um, I do think that there's some sort of loose sh sort of shared telepathy that goes on, you know, um, because there have been drummers that I've played with, you know, if I've played with them for five years or something like that, I can just look at them and change the style. And like, maybe I'm giving some, some body language clues or something, but it's just instantaneous. We both know what the other one's doing and we just lapse into it, you know, um, and which is, you know, normally in a band, you'd say something to the drummer, right? <laughs> but <laughs> when you're, when you're playing a brass instrument, you just, you just got to make, you know, googly eyes. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you, you do feel that happen. And then there's also something that, uh, you know, if, if you're, I think this is especially apparent if you're doing anything improvisational, um, there's something that there's something that happens that feels a lot like channeling or a lot like a third person kind of POV. That's what I was kind of getting yeah. at. That no, it, it's it's a thing. The mystical yeah. kind of like all ritual has a musical component, mm -hmm. and it just seems like music and dealing with the other side are always kind of close by. Yeah, I, I would I would agree with that. Um, and and I do think that there's something, you know, there are these moments that stick out. Like it's always fun to play music. Well, not always fun. <laughs> so that, I've been on some bad gigs, um, but you know, it's it's often fun to play music, and uh, it's often um, uplifting. But there's some moments that are just um, uncannily transcendent. If that makes any sense? Like you just you kind Oops. of just stand there, like I can't really explain what just happened. Um, and yeah, there's also this component. Like I think that again, I think it 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 tends to shine through if you're doing more improvisational stuff, which is a lot of what I, of what I do nowadays. Don't get me wrong. Like sometimes, like you know, I I poop the bed doing something. Right. Like I'm not saying it's it's perfect every time, but like no, no. It's... And some of it's probably muscle memory, but other times you like, especially if you're listening back, you're like, where did that come from? That that wasn't me doing that. I don't know where that came from. Um, you know, I don't, I, I, I am not capable of thinking that quickly to, 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 to do what I, to pull off what I pulled off. So yeah, um, there are a lot of different, uh, components like that. And, you know, just the other thing, and it's probably the most, oh, it's probably the most simultaneously encouraging and frustrating thing about music is that, um, there really isn't, uh, there really isn't a good way of so sometimes things just don't work you know or they just do work like you you write something and it just it shouldn't work but it does or it should work but it doesn't you know 
And then there's this other aspect, which I, is another one of those things we were talking about, like, you know, instinct and whatnot, that we just sort of gloss over as being an explanation, you know. Mass hysteria is another one of those things. Like, we just say, oh, it was mass hysteria, and then we just move on, right? And <laughs> nobody ever really questions the mechanisms and, and why that works. Um, My favorite, mass hallucination. Yeah, oh, yeah, which... that's a great one, too, yeah. Miracle that's... of the Sun. Miracle that... of the Sun, mass hallucination, yeah. That'd be more um, amazing than whatever they're seeing. <laughs> but, like, but I don't know why... Um, I mean, so much of when you see live music is the crowd, um, you know, and there's a dead crowd. It's yes, there are a lot of people who are professionals that can power through. And I've played with some of those groups and it's it's that's that's the thing. You can see a fantastic show and there's nobody there or, or nobody who cares. Like I've seen that happen. I've been a part of that. But at the same time, like if you have a crowd who is really into it, there is some sort of two way feedback loop that happens. And I you know, I guess the simple explanation is everybody in the band gets excited and they perform better or they push themselves, but I don't know if it's that simple. You know, it I, seems I think like a new agey merging of energies, to be very honest. I mean, I mean, yeah, yeah it, it, it does feel that way. I mean, you know, and, and, uh, <laughs> It doesn't explain those guys in the band who are just there to collect the paycheck, who don't really care, who <laughs> still also perform really well on those nights. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. It's like, ah, I thought you didn't care, dude. What's I thought you were too cool for school. So yeah, I mean, there are a lot of little things that are in that sort of like egregoric, telepathic, morphic resonance, um, channeling kind of realm um, that. Uh, that you that you do run into with live music a lot yeah that that makes a lot of sense that i i don't have an explanation but i know it's a thing you know yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's it's and it's one of the reasons why you know i i don't i don't get called very often for classical work and when i do i don't normally take it because it's just it's so locked down you know and mm-hmm. rigid mm-hmm. Um, you know that and like when you play classical music like there's always somebody in the audience who's like trying to catalog all your mistakes you know (laughs) (laughs) probably uh, the the most judgmental audience you're gonna get (laughs) yeah i mean that's that's the reason that recitals that's the reason that you know i could be terrified in recitals and i could play in in a you know i could play in front of a stadium and and not feel half as nervous as i would for a recital of 15 people <laughs> because it's like well i'm just doing my thing and you know mm-hmm. we mess up here and there but we're all here and have a good time so yeah <laughs> that's that's cool it's really cool one last thing um i would like to ask anything and if the answer is no that's a fine answer <laughs> too <laughs> but anything in recent um recent current events that's grabbed your attention in the paranormal world there's one thing there's one idea that i cannot get out of my head um and it was one of the most novel things that i've heard in a while so it 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 does kind of excite me um so i don't know if you're familiar with martin kottmeyer he's one of the unsung heroes of modern ufology um it's really he, familiar, but I can't place. Yeah, him. he's he's done some MUFON journal articles here and there, and I think he has a book that somehow is in Spanish but not in English, which kind of breaks my heart because I would love to read it. But um, but he uh, and I say somehow because he he's not uh, he's from like Illinois, so like I don't know hmm. where that Spanish connection comes in. But um, but he uh is incredibly eloquent and a very deep thinker and someone who I admire. Um uses a nom de plume on facebook um but he uh he had played with the idea and he introduced this idea in my head that i can't get out of my head which is uh if we have seen sort of this evolution of this main ufo contact modality evolve over the years so like set aside bigfoot and cryptids and all this other stuff let's just look at the ufo thing and it does seem to be a progression from generalized spirits to you know spirits and the dead to the fairy folk to the you know modern extraterrestrial thing what's the next iteration of that and he Mm -hmm. uh put forth the idea and i can't get this out of my head now that perhaps that might be ai oh wow so not necessarily that ai would actually be that thing right (laughs) but the idea that like the 
the idea of artificial intelligence becomes the um, shorthand slash anxiety point around which this other phenomena gravitates. Does that make sense? Are so, you kind um, of like the William Gibson idea, cyberpunk, that the no, it's the Loa are operating through the internet. I mean, perhaps, perhaps, but it's. I think it's more along the lines of like that's the new face that we give this thing. So oh, the phenomenon, okay. the phenomenon has remained constant. It was never spirits in the way that they were thought of. It was never fairies in the way that we were thought that we thought of them. It was never extraterrestrials in the way that we like to think of it. Even though the phenomenon was constant. Now we're going to start saying, oh, it's, you know, it's an AI, you know, the, the magic is going to become AI driven and, you know, that, that that's going to be our explanation for it. That would Even not though, surprise me. Yeah, I can't, because, because you would think that if this is an evolving mask or, you know, these masks get switched out from time to time, what would be the next thing that, what would be the next mask that would be chosen? And that's, that's the only thing that I can really think of, you know. Yes. Um, no. Have you heard of that being that has been showing up in AI art? That's that really weird looking woman. I want, I'm maybe yeah, getting I, the name wrong. Laha. Yeah, um, I, I've heard I've heard about this, and I had something really cool to say about it on a podcast a while back, and I can't remember what it was, and I really wish I could remember what it was. <laughs> um, but, it, it it well it it does call to mind an idea that um. Our mutual friend uh, Red Pill Junkie has talked about, which is this idea that any sufficiently complex system might draw into it, might attract consciousness. You know what I mean? So yes. Like, yeah. Um, so I don't know. Um, or even I, the idea that if if I, if AI was real and it's like a real intelligence, not just a mimicry of us, but it's a true intelligence. Then maybe spirits would use that as a channel, yeah, or yeah. a residence. Yeah, yeah. That's 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 kind of where I I would land because I mean I we I really don't want to get into all my feelings on AI at this point, but um, <laughs> I'm not as nearly as enamored with it, nor am I nearly as amazed with it um, as a lot of folks are. I do think it's an interesting tool, but um, but yeah, I think that there's there's an interesting case to be made that. Uh, that consciousness it's almost like uh the way you set up you know molecules in a, in a magnetic pole and it's like you know the magnetism happens because of the particular arrangement so maybe mm -hmm. consciousness is something like that that just happens because of a particular arrangement of of sufficient complexity you know? um which you know might have implications for certain complex systems here in our you know right now in our world you know it's like oh, our, yeah. our, our, our ecosystems conscious you know um <laughs> but yeah it's it's an interesting idea too um you sort of it's sort of like a <laughs> an inadvertent frankenstein's monster you know how like frank dr frankenstein had to like call down lightning and oh yes and, yes use it with a soul this is just the idea that you make the monster and then the lightning just happens um <laughs> you know, consciousness lightning just happens yeah i'm not sure if, if if that might be what happens but anyway i this idea of of the next mask of the phenomenon being ai not literally ai being the phenomenon but like the next mask of the phenomenon yes. being AI, is something that i i wish i didn't find it as likely as i do <laughs> that i have not heard that exact idea before but it makes complete sense that this yeah. would this would be the form that we would now find acceptable. Yeah, now I, we we've moved away from alien scientists. Now, it's an intelligent computer that's talking to us. Yeah, and 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 it's like you know the reason I think it's stuck with me is because if it is indeed a progression, there's got to be something next, right? And we've had yeah. the we've had the alien thing for you know if you want to be generous, a couple hundred years. Um, if you want to be more restrictive, like at least the past, you know. 100 to 70 so like maybe it's time for there to be a new mask yeah so that <laughs> that is fascinating that is very interesting um well hey thanks a lot for appearing here josh i really appreciate it oh it was a blast um time. where where can people uh locate you and your products and your services and things joshuacutchin.com j-o-s-h-u-a-c-u-t-c-h-i-n.com uh 
today I finally approved the final layout for an essay collection uh, that oh. I edited. Um, it's been three years in the making uh, for various reasons, um, but it's finally out. I never thought it would see the day. So, well, I said it's finally out. Lock on wood. Um, but there's no more work for me to do on it. Let's put it that way. Um, and it's an essay collection on uh, fairy films. Uh, oh, not, wow. it's not like, you know, it's not just about fairy films. It's also about looking at films that aren't explicitly to do with fairies through the lens of, of fairy folklore. Um, so it's a real rogues gallery of contributors, some of which some names you'd be familiar with. Um, and that should be coming out the next couple of weeks. So keep an eye out for that. Sounds very interesting. Well, hey, um, this has been the weird part. I am your host, Vincent Trewell. My special guest tonight has been the one and only Joshua Cutchin. Um, thanks for listening. Good evening. All right. Thanks.